future of Europe, not really an easy topic uh, to talk about um, because it's very multidimensional. But I thought I would start, start with um, a, a short reflection of Nightian uncertainty. And uh, this is a very nice quote from uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, columnists in the Financial Times, John Kay, who, uh, who said, the reader who once asked me which black fans were more likely, most likely to materialize in the next five years could not, even ha could not have missed the point more comprehensively. And so a, a little bit I feel like, uh, like, like, like John here, uh, please talk to me about the future of Europe. Well, there's a lot of unexpected things that can happen in the next uh, five or 10 or, or 20 years, and it's very difficult to, to predict those things. Um, and so I think perhaps the key question that we should ask ourselves is how can we uh, make the system the socio-economic and the political system uh, robust to deal with the unexpected, but by the way, also to deal with the expected. And there's a number of things uh, in the realm of what is expected that I, I, I will mostly talk about because those things uh, you can at least show, show some ideas here. Um, so so that's, that's perhaps my, my starting point. And I, you know, when, when, when thinking about um, the expected problems that, that could arrive, uh, I think of, uh, of a number of fault lines um, that uh, uh, we should think of uh, in the European Union um, and in Europe more generally. I think the first one, and Adam already alluded to it, is the issue of divergence and convergence. To what extent do we diverge and to what extent do we converge? Um, the second, I think, major issue is, of course, monetary union, a monetary union without a state. Um, uh, what is it we need to do, what is it we can do, and how can we make the, the union, the monetary union, a more robust system that can withstand um, future, sh future shocks. A third issue is certainly the external threats, um, migration, um, certainly also the new U.S. administration, um, but also uh, more generally um, uh, uh, issues like climate and uh, climate change and so on and so forth. Uh, f uh, fourth point, the relation between the EU and uh, its neighborhood. Um, this is actually also a very interesting and uh, a very sensitive topic and has be just become yesterday a little bit more interesting uh, with um, the letter, the notification um, uh, by Prime Minister May to, to President Tusk uh, about the intention of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. So, so there is, I think, a significant reflection that we need to do about how is going to be our relation with uh, the United Kingdom going forward? And it is an issue we should, should be discussing prominently. Uh, contrary to, um, if I may uh, say so, the, um, the, white, uh, the white paper of the European Commission um, that talks about the future of Europe um, and then uh, equates Europe with the EU27 and doesn't even mention uh, um, the, the United Kingdom, which I think is a, is a, is a big mistake. Finally, um, multi-speed within Europe, how do we deal with uh, different levels of integration inside um, the European Union? I think it is a real issue and it needs to be um, addressed, uh, addressed prominently. Now, what I want to do today, and um, uh, so I apologize, I actually have a PowerPoint, so I, I will show some charts and some data sort of to give you a sense of where we stand on some of these issues. And then I want to talk about uh, essentially five steps that I think are important uh, to overcome uh, um, uh, some of these uh, fault lines and to increase the robustness of the system, really. Okay, but before uh, starting with the negatives, let me give you, uh, give you uh, a few good numbers. Uh, job creation is, uh, is here. Um, I think what I want to point out uh, is that at least finally we are back in a situation where jobs are being created in Europe. And it's actually significant numbers of jobs, depending on the countries we look at, that are being created. And I think that's good news, and we should not, not forget about it. Let me also mention that finally there seems to be a sort of an uptick of inflation. Um, it's still not really visible in, uh, in core inflation, but at least we have uh, overcome this, this very long period where essentially we were at the brink or... Um, in the period of actually falling into deflation, which is of course very, very dangerous uh, for the EU and for a number of countries in the Eurozone in particular. So there are some uh, bright uh, spots, um, uh, certainly out there in the, in the, in the macro data. Um, but uh, here comes the more, uh, more gloomy side of the, of the picture. 
Uh, and I want to start with um, productivity, productivity growth, um, which has been uh, falling around the world. I mean, this is, this is well documented and, and often discussed. You see that, for example, the United States uh, uh, TFP growth has been uh, only half of what it used to be a decade earlier, so, so a very significant reduction. Also Japan is down, um, also uh, uh, the European Union as a, as a whole is down, but the European Union as a whole is really much, much more down than, uh, than the rest of the world. And within the European Union, there's a number of countries uh, that look really worrying. Uh, one of the big ones uh, is Italy, that is, uh, had essentially negative uh, TFP growth uh, over the last 10 years. Um, and you know, one of the, the fundamental questions is whether that will change in the next 10 years or not. Um, you can show this in, in geographical uh, uh, terms. So these are sort of nice, nice maps that, that a research assistant of mine produced. So if you, if you look at on the left, uh, so red is sort of bad, green is, is great, right? So, so you see that TFP um, in the south of Europe um, uh, is still not, uh, not where, where we would like it to be. In Spain, it's picking up now. These are numbers 2000 to 2014. Uh, but certainly, uh, we do see a divergence here with a, a red south, a green east, uh, and sort of uh, in between uh, a, a center. Now, let's take a sort of a, a different indicator, which is uh, PISA, um, so the results in, in reading tests um, across the European Union. Um, and you also see significant differences uh, across countries with Italy, Greece, but uh, even more worrying, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, really doing, doing pretty badly, while the North um, and the West are doing, doing much better. So I think a real substantive di divergence that is um, a, a, a fault line for the European Union, certainly. Let's talk about debt, um, divergences of debt, and it has many reasons, so let me just show the numbers, so to speak, um, and show it in a geographical way. Again, um, uh, so the left panel is, is government debt um, as a share of GDP, and you see Greece, Italy, Portugal um, are in the red, um, while uh, the north and the east are, are more in the, in the green, while France is sort of in the middle. Uh, you can look at corporate debt and, and household debt, the picture looks a little bit different. Um, so, so Italy does not have a major corporate debt problem, does not have a major uh, household uh, debt prob problem as of yet. Um, but, uh, but, but certainly um, there is also a northeast southwest divide uh, in, the, in this picture. Let's talk about inequality. Um, I think a very important topic for uh, socioeconomic cohesion. Yeah? I mean, so, so where do we stand on... on income inequality, well, this is just one indicator, which is the Gini coefficient, and you see that the south of Europe and the United Kingdom, and as a matter of fact, um, are in fact um, have very high levels of, of income inequality. So this is disposable income inequality, so after redistribution. United Kingdom is still doing better than the United States uh, in, in uh, Gini, uh, Gini coefficient terms, um, but uh, is among the highest in the European Union. And then you have, um, well, the green, the greenish ones, um, which are sort of France, the Benelux, Germany, um, uh, uh, some, uh, some Central Eastern European countries, South, uh, well, Austria, uh, Slovakia is also doing relatively well in this, in this indicator, um, and, and, the north, uh, and the north of Europe. So again, very, very big differences in income inequality, showing that the social models we are having are also working very differently. Um, income inequality in the EU as a whole, however, is, has been going down, and that's something that uh, is not widely known. Um, so you look at, at, at um, uh, th this, these numbers, which show um, the entire distribution of income inequality across the entire European Union, and you will see that, <coughs> in fact, um, uh, the uh, inequality levels um, in the EU as of 28... Um, have been um, uh, uh, falling um, after redistribution, um, while um, they have been increasing um, in the United States um, in the last uh, 15, 15, 20 years. Now, a lot of this has to do in the European Union with convergence. So, East European countries, 
uh, increasing their GDP per capita levels more quickly than, than West European countries. Um, uh, but um, uh, it also has to do with a functioning welfare state, which you can see by the fact that the, um, uh, the uh, net income, is, so, so after transfers, so the disposable income inequality is falling while the market one is actually relatively stable across the EU28. Okay. Now, let's talk a bit about um, the, the macroeconomic divergences uh, in the European Union. Well, this one, I think, is, is very well known, and I think it's important to, to talk about it. Um, it is um, the uh, current account uh, balance of the Eurozone um, and its components. Um, so the Eurozone, Eurozone current account balance uh, by now is almost 400 billion uh, euros uh, uh, per year. Um, now, most of that um, comes from um, the country I know best, as one says in Brussels, um, which is uh, close to, so Germany has a current account surplus close to, close to 300 billion. Um, and I think it's important to, to realize that this is not just a normal phenomenon. It shows that something is deeply wrong in, in, uh, in, in the way uh, the macroeconomy works in the Eurozone. And I think we need to think about this and reflect on it. Um, Price um, and, and uh, cost, con cost divergence or convergence. So this is uh, unit labor cost divergence in the Eurozone. And uh, what you see is you see that there has been huge uh, divergence uh, in the first 10 years of monetary union. And since the beginning of the crisis, um, there has been adjustment in the small periphery countries of the Eurozone. So in other words, uh, what is small, so Greece has adjusted, Ireland has adjusted, Portugal has adjusted. The biggest one that has adjusted is, uh, is Spain. Um, so, so Spain um, has, uh, has adjusted its unit labor cost um, and actually sees now a lot of job creation. Um, but the three countries that uh, essentially uh, only very recently started to adjust um, are the three big ones, Germany, France, um, and, and Italy. Um, and the adjustment is extremely gradual. Huh? I mean, so the gap is still very, very big in terms of unit labor cost uh, between, uh, on the one hand, Germany, and on the other hand, Italy um, and France, uh, France in the middle. And, you know, this divergence um, needs to be fixed if we ever want to have balanced growth and balanced current accounts uh, and um, more, jobs, uh, more jobs in some of the countries that have lost uh, relative to Germany, and the question is, how do you fix this this divergence? That's one of the big debates. I certainly belong to those who believe um, there is a role for all three countries, all three big countries to play, including for Germany. So this cannot be done. Contrary to the adjustment of Greece and, and Portugal, that can be done asymmetrically because it's small countries in the periphery that adjust to the big one. Here we talk about three big countries and adjustment of these three big countries to each other cannot expect two big countries to adjust to, to adjust in one big country not to do anything. So there will, be, will have to be adjustment on all three sides, and I, I'm happy to talk about this in a little bit, uh, a little bit later in more detail. Investment, Adam also mentioned, uh, mentioned investment. I think it's by now well known that investment um, has been performing quite poorly um, in, uh, in the EU uh, over the last uh, 10 years, roughly. Um, what we do here is, you know, a very simple exercise trying to um, uh, uh, think where could investment be if a trend pre-crisis had continued. And we take a very long-term trend. So this is a trend from 1970 to, uh, I think, 2002. So we excluded the bubble years, yeah? We excluded the bubble years 2002 to 6, which were, had extraordinarily high investment. Um, and, and therefore have this trend line, which is the dashed line, and then we, we plot the actual investment. Now, nobody knows what the equilibrium investment is, but I think it gives you a sense that, uh, you know, we are very significantly below some form of a trend line. And so I think there is a real investment issue, and Juncker um, and his commission have rightly prioritized this, um, but of course um, the measures they have put up uh, are based on very few resources, and um, they are effectiveness can at least be, be questioned. Banking problems. Um, 
Well, we know the divergence between the United States and the Eurozone. Uh, the United States um, has um, brought down its non-performing loans uh, since the beginning of the crisis quite significantly. In the Eurozone, the NPLs uh, continue to go up um, and are now at a pretty high level. And they're geographically not evenly distributed, but they're quite concentrated um, in <coughs> the south um, uh, um, uh, of Europe, um, so uh, certainly a big issue to look into. Trade um, is, I, I think, also quite important to look at trade. And why is it important to look at trade? Well, because basically the European Union is a very open economy. The European Union has roughly 43% of its GDP in exports, so very, very open compared to China, which has 22 percent, uh, and the United States, uh, 13 percent. So we are very much dependent on the global trade cycle, and whatever happens with the global trade cycle, be it because of a new agenda in, in Washington, or be it because of uh, whatever happens in China, or some external shocks, has huge effects on, on the European economy, and we therefore need to think about trade. But trade has also, within the European Union, diverged quite substantially. While the growth in trade uh, in the first years of monetary union was mostly driven by intra-EU trade, yeah, so we've been trading more with each other, since the beginning of the crisis, the trade growth, growth comes from outside of the European Union. Basically, trade towards other Eurozone countries in particular has collapsed, um, and uh, Germany has, uh, in particular, has redirected its, its trade uh, to the rest of the world. And one of the political divergences that we can observe here is that um, Germany more and more, not only Germany, but many of the northern European countries that are very integrated in the global trade and global value chains, more and more um, will continue to have an interest in global trade, in, global, in the position of the EU on global trade matters while uh, some of the southern uh, European countries will increase, uh, will, less, will less so be interested because their trade uh, has not grown with the rest of the world to the, same, to the same extent. So we do see also some divergences here. Policy divergence or concentric circles. Um, when we talk about multi-speed Europe, so everybody in, in Brussels sort of says, well, what, what, do, what do they mean? We already have multi-speed Europe. Well, we have multi-speed Europe, but we, we do have actually some form of concentric circles, and that's what this chart is, is trying to, to show. Uh, I mean, in, uh, in economic uh, governance matters, um, there is basically no differentiation within the Eurozone. So within the Eurozone, everybody has signed up to the same kind of compacts and contracts and unions and however they are called. So, so everybody is on the same page. And then you have different sets of countries outside of, of the Eurozone also signing up to these, uh, to these groups. Uh, but the Eurozone is basically a core, and so far nobody has really differentiated uh, the Eurozone. Now then there are some other circles you can draw, for example on Schengen, um, uh, so on migration. Ireland is not part of Schengen, while, while others, uh, while non-Eurozone can other, while Eurozone, non-Eurozone countries are part of Schengen. So in other policy areas, there is sort of overlap, different overlaps. But I think in economic terms, uh, the Eurozone mostly is the, is the core um, of the policy institutions that have been built in the, in, the last, in the last few years. Okay, so I think this is the picture, to, uh, my, my broad-based sort of picture to show you where do we stand. And let me talk about... Um, a few, uh, exactly five issues that I think we, we need to look, look into going, going forward. I think the first priority list on, on my robustness list is to, to actually tackle existing problems. <laughs> and, you know, that sounds trivial, but I think it's actually not trivial, it's, it's fundamental. And, uh, you know, we can talk about several ones. I, I actually forgot to put Greece here, but okay, let me talk about the, the, the ones I mentioned here. The first one is, is the productivity agenda. Now, we can have endless academic debates about uh, Bob Gordon and the slowdown in global productivity and so on. I mean, all of this is very important, but I don't think that's the issue that we really face in the Eurozone and in the EU. I mean, most of the countries of the EU are well behind the productivity frontier 
So there's lots of scope to move up to the productivity frontier. This is not a Robert Gordon problem that the productivity frontier is moving uh, less quickly. It's a problem that a number of countries have very substantial uh, 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 structural, deep structural issues, including PISA, education, including other things that prevent them from moving, corruption and so on, that prevent them from moving up to the frontier. Extremely important to tackle that. Ultimately, uh, uh, it requires national ownership um, and it cannot be done, done out of Brussels. The second issue is banks. Um, well, I showed you the, S, uh, the, the NPL problems. Now, for all of those who have followed a little bit um, sort of um, the, the banking supervision, I think it's fair to say that um, the SSM and the ECB with it, so the SSM is in the ECB, the single supervisory mechanism is in the ECB, are at risk of losing their credibility currently. And I think it's important to, to reflect on this because two years ago, uh, we created, two and a half years ago, we created um, the supervisory mechanism and it was created with the big promise to, to change the way we do banking supervision and to use it as a new way to actually tackle banking problems that we are having in our countries and to do it in a way that would not um, uh, be dependent on uh, uh, national political preferences and national political interests, but rather uh, based on principles and in the European interest. Now, the Italian bank banking problem that we are seeing currently uh, refers to all the banks that in 2014 have, were identified as being problematic. It's the same banks that we are talking about now. Um, and I think one can rightly ask why this issue um, is, not, is not yet fully addressed and fully settled. Now, Adam mentioned the importance of, you know, when you're a technocracy, um, you know, take power and, and use it. And here's one example of what I think should, should happen, uh, which is um, the European Parliament should stand up to the plate. I remember very well how the European Parliament fought for the right to hold the SSM to account, to call in the chair of the SSM. So if you look at the SSM regulation, there is a clear paragraph put in there because of the European Parliament's push to really force them to, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to, uh, to call in the chair of the SSM and to hold that chair of the SSM to account, at least in the sense of getting her, to her, her so Daniel Nui, to answer um, what, what she uh, and the SSM is doing. Now, I was yes, the day before yesterday, I was, was discussing this with um, Benoit Curé and, and an MEP, Benoit Curé from the ECB and, and, and an MEP. And, um, and um, you know, one of the, the things I heard from, from the MEP was, um, well, you know, it's so difficult for us and the media doesn't listen and so on uh, when, we, when we ask and question um, uh, the institutions. Well, you know, then what I did is a, a simple exercise. I, I asked a research assistant to actually listen to the hearings because they are terribly boring, frankly speaking, if you ever have listened to, to a hearing uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, so listen to the entire hearing and um, hear what kind of questions were asked to the chair of the SSM um, in the two uh, hearings that happened, so November 2016 and March 2017. And I'm afraid uh, the research assistant in both hearings did not find that the European parliamentarians did ask serious questions about the handling of Italian banks. Now, I'm not passing judgment on what exactly happened in the Italian banks, but I, I do think that a European parliament needs to hold um, European institutions to account so that we get better results. And an example of... Um, you know, which is sort of very public and very, very much watched by the media. Is that's why I have this picture here. Is, is of course U.S. Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren, who uh, in this YouTube video that was watched 300,000 times, um, uh, uh, destroys, as the title says, destroys Janet, uh, uh, Janet Jellen over uh, J.P. Morgan's uh, living living will discussion. So it's a specific issue, fairly technical issue, but 300,000 watches I think is quite, quite a bit of impact, and so. I guess what I'm trying to say here is I agree with Adam. I mean, we have institutions, and those institutions should, should actually you know, be more forceful on, 
uh, on, on what they can do, and they have fought for the, those rights, and they, they should be doing this, and that would deliver better results, and that's very important. Now, my second point on the robustness list is, of course, the external agenda. I do think that um, the new person in the White House can become a real threat um, in many dimensions, but let me talk about the trade dimension. Um, certainly, um, uh, tariffs um, or uh, uh, border tax adjustment uh, for, uh, for, for uh, I mean, for... Um, uh, for for uh, for corporate for corporations uh, can you know impact really significantly European interests and European trade and that is a big problem for Europe because it's so dependent on trade. Now, with, together with my colleagues Maria de Merzis and and Andre Sapir, we have proposed a few steps of what the European Union could and should do in 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 this situation. And of course, it's important to remember that the U.S. is and remains uh, uh, our main, one of our main trading partners, one of our main investment partners. But I do think we should um, develop uh, some uh, preparations to deal uh, with uh, a, a potential, um, yeah, well, toughening of the situation in, in Washington. Um, and one option is, of course, to, to work with others, including China, in support of um, multilateralism. The second topic is, um, is climate change. As you know, the Obama administration has very much made sure that uh, some countries extremely reluctant to sign um, the Paris Agreement uh, did sign it in the end, including Saudi Arabia and others. Um, and uh, if, with, with Donald Trump in the White House, those people may be ready to, to deviate. And and get out of the agreement. And the problem is, as soon as you have a critical mass of countries getting out of a global agreement, that, that global agreement essentially loses its entire effectiveness. I mean, it's like, uh, like, a, like a common pool problem, right? Where you, so you have a pot of fish. If you have 10, 10 fleets fishing um, and one is, uh, uh, one is not sticking to the rules, it's probably still okay because sort of the other nines are sticking to the rules. Um, and the one cannot fish more than a certain amount. But if you have three or four uh, uh, ships uh, starting to fish, um, the pool gets actually exploited very quickly. And, and it doesn't make sense for the other six to continue uh, restricting their fishing. So I think it's going to be very important to make sure that if the U US and apparently uh, Donald Trump is going in this direction, if they are withdrawing from, um, from the Paris Agreement, uh, to make sure that the global consensus by all the others actually stays there. And I do think there are a number of tools that um, the European Union can use, and that include um, uh, carbon border adjustment uh, uh, taxes as a threat um, uh, to those that want to deviate. Third issue is migration. I mean, currently immigration from Africa is, is actually fairly stable. <clears throat> so the numbers are around, uh, and this is just Africa because I'm actually presenting a paper next week in, in Malta on, on Africa, and so that's why I have these numbers. But Middle East is, of course, also a major country of origin. But let's talk for a moment of, about Africa. So we have fairly stable immigration numbers, uh, currently 500,000 per year, roughly. There's been a lot of noise about a recent increase, which is mostly boat people. Um, but this is really uh, very recent, and it's still below 200, 250, 300,000 uh, per year. So if you include those, the numbers go up a bit. But overall, it's a relatively stable picture. But I do think we need to be aware that um, these immigration numbers will increase, um, and they will increase because of uh, essentially three major developments. One is economic development in Africa itself. So with economic development, migration numbers will first actually go up. There's a pretty well-established literature that shows that below a certain GDP per capita level, if your GDP per capita increases, you're actually more likely to migrate. Okay? And most of Africa is below that threshold. And if the continent develops, there will be more migration uh, from the continent. Not all to Europe, but also to Europe. The second issue is demographics. Um, Africa currently has one billion uh, citizens. Um, the projections for 2050 are that it will increase to 2.5, so more than, more than double, so very significant increases. And of course, we know that when the European economy goes better, do, does better, 
it attracts more immigrants. I mean, that's just a very natural, natural phenomenon. So I do think we have to, to think about this, this issue very carefully and work on it. It means working on integration policies. It means also developing a ring of friends, how I would call it. Um, so countries around the European Union with whom we want to co collaborate, with whom we want to uh, uh, offer, to whom we want to offer economic and other opportunities. Um, and that will in turn also collaborate with us on, on migration. Well, then there's the military cooperation. I mean, I think um, there is an agenda there. I think most of that agenda should be um, about uh, cooperation and not about building a European army. I think this, I mean, I was the other day, I think on, uh, on Austrian television, in fact, in a talk show, um, they asked me, well, shouldn't we have a European uh, nuclear bomb, yeah? <laughs> I was really falling off the chair with this question. I mean, I, I really don't, don't think that, um, uh, the European Union at the moment can actually have that um, because, uh, you know, if you want to have a nuclear bomb, I mean, you need political legitimacy at a level that the European Union certainly does not have. have. I mean, so, so, uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know who, who, who would, who would uh, be holding the trigger, so to speak. Yeah? I mean, so this is, I think this is not the right way, but military cooperation, I do think, is the right More way. More than one person, probably. More than, yeah, exactly. So we have 10 people deciding. Okay. <laughs> okay. So third issue is, uh, is, of course, the divergence agenda that I highlighted in my, in, my, um, uh, in my charts. Well, I do think we need to reduce the current account and price divergences in the euro area. Um, that mostly concerns the large countries. Now, the policy agenda in terms of what has to be done, I think, is relatively uh, well known. Um, Germany, uh, stop running 24 billion budget surplus, increase your capital stock, both private and public, open service sectors, achieve a higher wage share. And I'm happy to talk more about the, the wage share because it's actually a very interesting discussion, the wage share and, and how it has developed in Germany compared to France and Italy. In France, on the, uh, on the other hand, uh, the big issue is size of the state, deficit labor markets. In Italy, it's also labor markets, product market reforms uh, and reform of the state. Finally, investment, um, as I said, is, is still very low, and I do think we, we can do more here. Um, Germany and France both, uh, I think, have a, have a real responsibility to overcome their divergences of the last year. And I'm actually quite optimistic that we will achieve that with the new elections uh, outcoming. But, you know, we don't know how the elections uh, will end up. But, but I do think we have, to, we have to address this issue. Uh, fourth issue um, for robustness, well, improve the Eurozone architecture. But look, I mean, the key issue is always how do you deal uh, in the monetary union, how do you deal with the relation between a single monetary policy uh, and federal, sub, uh, sub federal fiscal policies? And how do you deal with, in particular, the issue uh, of uh, debt becoming unsustainable? So there's basically two, two options that are discu being discussed. One is let's mutualize it. Well, that's pretty explosive politically, I can tell you. Let's not mutualize it. Well, it's actually also very controversial. Um, so in a sense, we are stuck here. And I do think when you, when you look at experiences of mature federations, I do think you can learn something from that. Um, and it is that uh, federal systems typically have a pretty clear and a pretty credible no bailout clause for the sub-federal level, while at the same time they do have a centralization of financial and banking policies, and they also usually have some tools at the federal level to take care of investment and to take care of um, uh, some social functions. Um, and I think Going in this direction is certainly what um, the Eurozone uh, will have to do. And, you know, this is, this is a paper we presented um, also at an informal ECOFIN. Very controversial that we just presented it there. But, okay, I, th I think it was the right discussion. Um, and, you know, we basically said, look, um, let's talk about at least step one and two. Step three is sort of an analytical benchmark. That's how we called it. Um, but it is, of course, important to think also of, about analytical benchmarks. But... Let's, let's start with the simple stuff, so, which is not so simple. Complete the banking union, which essentially means 
all the things I just talked about, denationalized banking policies, addressing MPLs, legitimizing a fiscal backstop. But also let's start talking about adding some funds for uh, public goods and investment and uh, you know, dealing with, with big shocks. There's also this whole discussion about you know, how should the ESM develop further. Um, I'm actually, I've been advocating a few years ago already that the ESM eventually should become some form of a, of a European monetary fund and, you know, uh, uh, fulfill more and more the, um, the function of a, of a backstop and, well, a nucleus, it's not a treasury, but at least a backstop to some of the, the functions that need to be centralized. Um, so I think this, this is my last, my last slide. Um, so managing multi-speed in Europe is, is a real challenge. I mean, there's some that say it's all not a problem. You know, we, some integrate more, others integrate less. It's not a problem. But I do think actually it, it does create uh, significant frictions. And it has created frictions also uh, with the United Kingdom, certainly. But it's also creating frictions with some of the Eastern European countries. Um, and I do think we need to, to manage that. A lot of that multi-speed currently is, however, not so much in the economic realm, but, but rather in political, cultural, and social divergence. Um, um, I think here of, uh, well, two countries um, to, the, to the north, east, and, uh, and east of Austria, um, sorry, so Poland and, and Hungary. Um, you know, and I think this, this is something where we, which we have to think very carefully about how, how we deal with this. And um, I think it would be a mistake to uh, be too, I mean, to, I think one has to be very compromising there, um, but also very clear, and it's a very delicate political question, ultimately. Let me just say, I think the rule of law um, is a fundamental feature of the European Union in that regard, and it's, by the way, also a fundamental element of a state. If you talk about the monetary union being a union without a state, well, what it has, does have, it, it actually does have rule of law and uh, a legal basis, and that's very important for the stability of the monetary union. So the rule of law is, is one of those principles that I think we cannot, we cannot sacrifice, and I'm actually quite um, unhappy that this, this point was uh, not mentioned in, in the declaration in, in Rome um, uh, for the 60th anniversary. Um, well, then there's the EU neighborhood. Um, Okay, I mean, we talked about Turkey in the previous panel, but let me talk uh, a few words about the UK. I mean, I, th I do think we need to have eventually some form of a deal with the United Kingdom. I mean, the United Kingdom is a major European power. We have lots of trade links. We have lots of um, uh, uh, historical links. It would be silly to think without a deal, the UK would disappear and would not be a player in Europe anymore. The UK is a player in Europe and will remain a player and we should uh, establish a fruitful uh, relation with them. So let's get over the Brexit bill discussion. If you want to know more about the Brexit bill, please go on our website. We published today a major paper doing all the accounting and showing all the numbers. Um, but let's get over that. I mean, this is at maximum 3% of British GDP that we are talking about. Let's, let's get over it and put the anger aside and talk about some form of a productive relation um, after, after Brexit. Um, last point, um, the EU institution. Well, I think there is uh, a lot that can be said. Um, certainly one of the big issues is the European Parliament and um, its legitimacy and how to improve it. I recently published a paper uh, showing that you can actually do a lot already now with Brexit. So Brexit means 75 MEPs are leaving. Um, and the question is, what do you do with them? I mean, what do you do with the 75 places? Do you just drop them? Do you reallocate them? Or how do you reallocate them? And you can actually change the composition and the geographical distribution, the representativeness of the European Parliament quite significantly. And I think we should, should be having this debate. And there is a debate ongoing on this. So I, I do think we can do quite a bit within the current treaties. Well, I talked about the ESM and I talked about the, uh, the European Commission, so let me conclude, um, and that is for you to fill in. Uh, well, I think it's overall a glass half. <laughs> okay, that's for you to find out. Thank you. Okay.